Hello, Illumineers and friends. I take it you're here because you love Disney, you love trading card games, or you love them both and discovered Disney Lorcana is exactly that. But now, I'm sure you're wondering how to play the game with the cards that have your favorite Disney animated characters on them. Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Illumineers Academy. We cover all aspects of Disney Lorcana, as well as a whole bunch of other Disney-related stuff. This video is going to specifically break down the card types and parts, then how the cards and abilities work, and finally, how to just play the game. First, we're going to give a quick overview of the game as a whole. The game is centered around collecting cards through pre-built decks and booster packs. You then take those cards and build a deck containing 60 of them, with a max of 4 of each specific card. Two or more Lumineers, aka players, then race to get to 20 lore and win the game. All the stuff in between will be covered next. Now, we're going to have to talk about the type of cards in the game. The main type of card you'll be seeing are characters. Characters are, well, as you probably guessed, characters from the Disney Animated Universe. These cards will be your main interactions throughout the game. They will challenge each other and work to get you to your 20 lore and win the game. The next type of card you will see are item cards. These cards range from anything like the Beast Mirror, from Beauty and the Beast, to a Dingle Hopper from The Little Mermaid. These cards have special abilities that you can use over and over again. The abilities can draw you cards, help you remove damage, or help you play your more powerful cards. The third type of card are actions. These cards act as a one-time ability once you play them from your hand, they go straight into your discard pile. These cards can be really anything like Dragon Fire, where Maleficent in her dragon form blows fire at Prince Philip, or Fire the Cannons, which Hook does in Peter Pan. These cards do almost anything and push your game further. Their only drawback is that they can only be used once. The final type of card are songs. These cards are actually a subsect of action cards. They are a one-time use ability that goes from your hand into your discard pile. The main difference is that you can use your characters to sing a song and then you get to play the card for free. How, why, and the cost of playing cards will be covered shortly. These cards are songs for movies like Be Our Guest, Friends from the Other Side, and Let It Go. So, now that we know all the different type of cards, let's break down what all the different numbers, symbols, and words on the card mean. Here's my favorite card right now, Simba. Returned King. He's a character, which we know for a couple of reasons. First, we look at his card classification. He is a storyborn hero king. All of those relate to the types of characters. The last reason, and usually the best way to tell, is that he has a listed strength, willpower, and lore value. These are all things that are, at least so far, reserved only for character cards. His strength is the number in the sun, his willpower is the number of the shield, and his lore value is the number of little diamonds right here. So, his strength is 4, his willpower is 6, and his lore value is 2. Let's look at the other parts of the card that will show up on all cards. Each card will have a name and a classification, like we already covered. They will also have this circle hexagon combo, or just a hexagon at the top. This denotes the cost of the card as well as if it's able to be added to your inkwell. Since Simba has a circle around his hexagon, he is able to be added to the inkwell. If we look at one jump ahead, we see that there is no circle, only the hexagon, so it cannot be added to your inkwell. We will be covering inkwells in the gameplay section of this video. All cards have an abilities and effects section located here. This will explain the different things the cards can do. Each card also has a description of the ability in case you forget what the keyword means. If we look at Simba again, we see that he has a challenger plus four and pounce. Later, we'll go over all the abilities that have been shown so far. The last thing that all cards will have is their ink symbol located here. We see that Simba is a steel ink and we will be releasing a video that covers covers the different inks and what they mean in the future. With that deep dive into the specifics of the cards, let's get into the gameplay. To set up a Lorikana game, the players will need to have their own decks, a way to track their lore accumulation, and a way to keep track of damages on their creatures. Once you have all that, you set your lore counters to zero, shuffle your decks, and draw seven cards. To decide who goes first, you should roll a six-sided die, and the player who wins the roll decides if they would like to go first or second. Once you've drawn your first seven cards, you can decide to swap 
some of those cards out if you don't like them. You do this by choosing a number of cards in your hand, placing them on the bottom of your deck, and then drawing from the top until you have seven cards again. Then you shuffle your deck one more time. Once you have done this, you have to stick with the cards you have in hand. Then whoever is the player that's going first can start their turn. A turn starts with what's called the beginning phase. First, you ready all your cards. This means you untap your expended ink and your exerted characters. Don't worry, we'll tell you what that means in a second. Then, if you have any effects that trigger at the beginning of the turn, they will happen. Last, in the beginning phase, is to draw a card. If you are the player taking the first turn, you skip the draw phase. This compensates for the slight advantage you receive by being the player to go first. After you've drawn your card, or skip drawing, you begin what is called the main phase. During your main phase, you can add one card to your inkwell, play a card, activate an item, use a character ability, challenge, or quest. It may seem like a lot, but don't worry, they're pretty easy to understand, and I'll explain them right now. Adding cards to your inkwell means you take a card from your hand that has an inkwell symbol in the corner and turn it face down in the bottom section of your play area. If we look at Simba, we see that he has a circle around his hexagon. This is the inkwell symbol. It means that he could be added to our inkwell. If we look back at one jump ahead, we see that the inkwell symbol is not there, so it can't be added. A quick important note, when you place a card into your inkwell, you aren't able to look at that card again, so make sure you remember what you've placed down there. To play a card, you must first exert enough of the ink in your inkwell to equal the cost of the card, or the number in the hexagon on the top left. To exert your ink, you tap the card sideways. Once they are exerted, they don't become readied again until the beginning phase of your next turn. If you play a character card, they are then placed onto the play area but can't be used this turn as you have to wait for the ink to dry. If you play an action or a song, the effect takes place immediately, and if you play an item, you may use its ability right away as items don't have to wait for their ink to dry. The only time this is different is when you use shift. When you shift a creature, you take a cheaper version of a creature and replace it with a more advanced version. Our favorite example of this right now is Stitch. Stitch New Dog is just a one cost character. He has only two strength, two willpower, and one lore. Not bad stats for a one cost character, but what if it's later in the game and we need more power? Well luckily, we have Stitch Rockstar, who has three strength, five willpower, and three lore value. He also has two abilities, Shift, which we're talking about now, and Adoring Fans. The Adoring Fans ability is pretty great as you get a lot of cheap card draw, but we'll talk about strategy in another video. Here we want to focus on the Shift ability. This ability allows us to not have to pay the full six to play Stitch Rockstar. As long as we have another Stitch in play, we can replace the one in play with the one in our hand for its Shift cost, which here is two ink cheaper. An important note, Shifted characters retain the character on the battlefield's ink dryness and damage counters. So if the character Shifted doesn't have ink dry, then neither does the new. Furthermore, if the character on the battlefield had two damage on it, so does the new one. Using an item is the same as activating an item, which is another thing that you can do during this phase. If we look at Lantern, we can see that to use its ability, we have to exert it, and then we can pay one less ink to play our next character. If we look at Coconut Basket, we see that we don't have to do anything with the card for its ability to be activated. It waits for us to play a character to trigger its ability. Finally, if we look at White Rabbit's Pocket Watch, we see that we have to exert it and pay one for its ability to happen. In your main phase, you can also use character abilities. If we look at Elsa, we see that her ability requires us to exert her, and then we're able to exert an opponent's character. We can only use this the turn after Elsa has been played because characters have to wait for their ink to dry. You can also use characters to quest or to challenge. Questing is the easiest, and maybe the most important. To quest with a character, you first have to look at their lore value. If we go back and look at Simba again, we see he has a lore value of 2. As long as it isn't the same turn as we play him, we can quest with him, exerting him and adding his lore value to our overall lore count. To remind you, the first player to get an overall lore count of 20 wins the game. The last thing we could do in our main phase is challenge an opponent's character. To do this, our opponent must have a character that is exerted, and we must have a character that isn't affected by ink drying. If we meet both of those criteria, we can use our character to challenge our opponent's exerted characters. When a challenge happens, we first exert our own character, then we apply damage equal to the strength of the creatures to each other. Let's look at Simba again, and say we used him to challenge our opponent, Scar Fire Usurper. Our Simba would deal 4 damage to our opponent's Scar, and our opponent's Scar would deal 5 damage to our Simba. This damage happens simultaneously. Also, our Simba has an extra ability in Challenge plus 4. This means that we add 4 to the amount of damage he deals, so we deal a total of 8 damage to our opponent's Scar. This wouldn't be added to his strength if he were the one being challenged. A damage counter can be anything you want it to be, even if it's just a little scrap of paper. Then we look 
to see if the amount of damage on the card is greater than the character's willpower. We see that Simba has 5 damage, which is less than his willpower, so he stays in play. Scar, however, has 8 damage, which is greater than his willpower, so he's banished and placed into your discard pile. Characters who aren't banished keep all the counters that they receive, so now our Simba only has to take one more damage to be banished. If you're able to do the math without always adding counters, that's totally fine too, and definitely helps the speed of the game. But for those who can't, don't feel bad. I'm sure you'll get there soon. Once you're done doing all or none of the things in your main phase, you pass your turn and your opponent starts it all again in their beginning phase, and you are well on your way into the game of Lorcana. A final few points to add about playing overall. As mentioned towards the beginning, the deck must contain a minimum of 60 cards. You can use more if you'd like. They can only have four of a certain card, so we can only have four Simba Return King cards, but we'll be able to play four of another type of Simba card, like Simba Exiled Lion, if that was a thing. You can only use two inks per deck. You can of course only use one. And finally, you can play with more than two players if you'd like. So that about does it. That's the basics on how cards work and what all the symbols mean, how to set up the game and how to play. If you have any questions or just want to say hi, leave it in the comments below. Also, if you have any suggestions on things that you'd like to see from us, put that down there too. Finally, don't forget to subscribe and have a magical rest of your day.